So um, thank you for joining us uh, today. I know it's evening for some of our panelists, but today in New York City, I'm, I'm sitting. Um, panel featuring Acura, American Committee for US-Russia Accords board members, Marlene Laruel and Anatole Levin, and uh, our ally, Petro Shakaryan, uh, to discuss what the war means for Russia at home. The war will end. How it ends, we do not know. Uh, we do not know what will follow. It will have enormous implications for the geopolitical landscape, for Europe, for NATO, for the world as it's already having. Uh, and of course, for and inside Russia. Today, we're gonna to discuss the short and the long-term. What's clear is that the civic and institutional fabric of Russia's society has been altered, changed, transformed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There are questions, many questions. Um, Will the Putin regime take an increasingly hard line against dissent? Will there be a Putin regime? If not, what kind of government or forces will rule Russia? What can we expect from the political fallout? Will nationalist and far-right movements grow stronger? How will the economic sanctions impact the elite people? Um, the discussion today will be uh, moderated by me, by James Carden, our executive director, and much more. And let me just take a minute to introduce the American Committee. This is one of a series of discussions, panels we've had over these last couple of years, very fraught times, difficult times. Our mission from the beginning uh, you know, has been to provide history context, robust discussion and debate uh, and in dialogue, in large space for diplomacy, restraint, realism with humanity and reduce tensions to avoid the revival of a more dangerous Cold War. Now that may seem quixotic. Um, the American Committee was founded in the early 70s. People like George Kennan, who we've heard much of in these last weeks, uh, Tom Watson of IBM, Donald Kendall of Pep Pepsi-Cola, John Kenneth Galbraith. And it worked then in a different climate, I would submit for detente. There was a community for detente in a way there isn't today, sadly. It was relaunched the committee by my late husband, Stephen Cohen in 2015. And we've worked very hard, as I said, to maintain a dialogue at a moment when the lockdown, particularly in the United States, maybe in other countries in Europe is such that it seems counterproductive for our mutual security and for uh, a world uh, without war um, and a world that is about restraint and not policing the world. So I wanna turn it over to James who will introduce uh, speakers who I'm eager to hear because these times are uh, at minimum, extraordinarily painful, vexing, hard to um, get a bearing on. And it's very important, it seems to me to hear from informed people. We'd be better off if on our screens every night, we had people like this speaking to us. So I turn it over to James and I thank you for joining us and follow the American Committee for US-Russia Accord. Okay, thanks very much, Katrina. Uh, today, uh, we have three brilliant scholars with uh, unmatched insights into what is happening in, within Russia. And they're joining us from uh, three different time zones across Europe and Eurasia. Uh, Marlene Lariel uh, joins us from Greece. She is director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, she's the director of the Illiberalism Studies Program, and she's research professor of International Affairs at George Washington University. Um, she gives regular lectures and seminars at uh, different policy institutions um, around Washington and the country. And she recently published a terrific book uh, titled, is Russia fascist unraveling propaganda East and West? And that's out through Cornell University uh, Press. Anatole Levin joins us from the UK. He is Senior Research Fellow on Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He was formerly a professor at Georgetown University uh, and in the War Studies Department of King's College in London. Uh, he holds BA and PhD from Cambridge in England and from 1985 to 1998. He worked as a British journalist in South Asia, uh, the former Soviet Union, 
uh, Eastern Europe and covered the wars in Afghanistan, Chechnya, and the Southern Caucasus. Um, and last, but certainly not least, is a great friend of mine and Katrina's, uh, joining us from Armenia, uh, Pietro Shakarian, is a native of Cleveland uh, and is a historian of Russia and the Soviet Union with a focus on uh, the Caucasus during the era of uh, Khrushchev's thaw. And he's working on a history of the Soviet Union's nationalities policy. Uh, he earned his doctorate in history at The Ohio State University, and he holds an MA in Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies at the, from the University of Michigan. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask Malen to kick things off. Professor, it's great to see you. Um, and I guess let's get right to it. Go yeah, ahead. thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, I just would like to begin maybe by giving a few points of where I think we are now in Russia in terms of, of domestic politics and, and the, the regime itself. And so let, let me begin by, by the regime. Uh, I think what we have been seeing since February 24 is that the regime has been pretty much shaken by the war itself. First, because a large part of the government and of the official were not informed of the war to come and so discovered it the same way we did. And secondly, because the regime was probably taken by surprise by the scope of the reaction coming from the West and by the fact that it was planned, to, what was planned to be a very short special operation is now becoming a really long-term uh, 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 war. So the regime has been shaken, but it has stabilized since then. And I think we have seen several signs of Russian elites kind of reconsolidating after the first one week or two weeks of kind of panicking moment, reconsolidating around uh, uh, Putin. We have almost no defection from anyone among the Russian elites or among Russian diplomats abroad. And I think that's uh, an interesting uh, uh, science to, to notice. And we have seen once the regime decided to change its strategy for Ukraine and not to try to conquer the wall of Ukraine or at least Kiev, but move to more kind of modest goal of conquering the Donbass, we have seen the emergence of a party of war in Russia. And I think that's important for us to keep that in mind, that there are today in Russia around the Kremlin, people who think that just conquer, conquering the Donbass is the wrong strategy and who wants the big one. And I'm saying that because it means that it's important for us to realize that Putin is not the worst. Putin is still a, a, a relatively moderate compared to some people inside its own entourage who are hoping for something that would be much more radical. And so what we see emerging now is so a kind of three, more or less three group that we can identify this party of war, really hoping for uh, the world conquest of Ukraine, of course, without any kind of uh, a real assessment on, on the, the failures of the Russian military on the ground, a kind of centrist, a uh, uh, um, group embodied probably by Putin who consider that conquering the Donbass and the sea, the Azov Sea region is already enough and would be considered as a victory. And then we had on the other side, the part of the government, the kind of civilian as technocratic aspect of the Russian government and part of the oligarchs for whom everything is a bad news, uh, uh, the small version of the war or the big version of the war. And I think it's also important to realize that this technocratic government is still functioning. It's trying to make things working, trying to manage the impact of the sanction, trying to have the state continuing running its everyday activities. And you have, uh, uh, people who are pretty efficient in managing the crisis and the impact of the sanction and trying to draw a future for Russia of functioning in the current context. The regime has become clearly more repressive, more authoritarian, more autarkic, largely deglobalized, but not entirely. And I think here also it's an important element to realize that Russia is decoupling itself from the West and the West from Russia, but the West is not the rest of the world. Right? And so the deglobalization of Russia is clearly a de-Westernization more than a deglobalization. And the contact with the, the kind of the global South are still there and still functioning. I know it's also difficult to hear for some uh, uh, people, but the level of repression in Russia is still pretty limited compared to what it could be. 
the uh, uh, laws that Russia has passed, like the 15 years pre uh, tr uh, prison for those who would be uh, uh, um, attacking the official version of the war, is almost not implemented. People who have been arrested are arrested and fined, are sent to jail for relatively modest time. So I think there is still we can see that the regime is trying to avoid having to move to large scale repression because they know they cannot afford that. They probably know that the population will not be supportive of that. And I think they don't want themselves as elites having to create that kind of mass repression mechanism. So they are trying to revive kind of Soviet style ideological indoctrination, but they don't hope for a kind of huge mass repression. The borders are also open, meaning that those who are unhappy are invited to leave. And I think that's also a sign we have to understand. Keeping the border open means that inviting people to leave is a way to avoid mass repression. Um, and so I think we see that the way that they are really trying to manage business as usual, the best they can in the current uh, context, even if, of course, the change is, is, a, is a pretty uh, a definitive one. An element that I think is also important to realize that the regimes refused to mobilize the men, right? There was a lot of discussion about the, the, the kind of partial or mass mobilization. There is a kind of uh, a, a slight mobilization happening informally, like they are checking, you know, the addresses of young men, being sure like they can reach out to them, trying to invite people to join the army, but they haven't made the move to decide for the mass mobilization. And I think that's also the sign that we need to interpret as the regime trying to slow down the radicalization and the mobilization of the society and trying to manage that at the kind of the, 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 the lower uh, uh, possible level. The population is in support of the war, but in support of what it knows of the war, which is the special operation in the Donbass version and a kind of more, a kind of rescue operation of uh, uh, the Donbass population. They don't see, of course, the, the, the side of the war that we see. Surveys are, of course, a, a big, have to be taken with, with caution for, for in wartime. But I think we can more or less agree that there is at least half of the population in support of the special operation. And we have seen a kind of defensive consolidation of the population around the regime. And I think that's also for us a way where we need to uh, uh, question the impact of sanction, as in Iran, we know that we have huge sanction on a country. We also create domestic consolidation around the regime. We don't allow people to create a space where they would imagine themselves living, being able to kind of defect from the regime or reinvent themselves without sanctions. So I think that's something to, to, to keep in mind. And the population is not mobilized as it was mobilized in 2014 with Crimea annexation. And here also, I think it's important to make that dissociation. People are not enthusiastic about the special operation. They are mobilized because they, they feel that the country is in danger. That's their interpretation. They feel that the, the kind of the, the West is now entirely anti-Russian. They feel that the sanctions are there to stay. And so it's a support for the war without the enthusiasms of 2014 and Crimea. Um, maybe my last point see that would be that it's still unclear what is the real end game uh, for Russia, but I think it's also very unclear what is the end game for the West. Uh, uh, on, on the Russian side, I think we have seen several narratives kind of competing with each other. Is that about non-NATO expansion? Is that about Ukraine not entering NATO and the EU? Or is that about part of Ukraine having to join Russia or to be in a kind of a secessionist uh, uh, status? Is that kind of the, the more ideological goal of the so-called denazification? And we can see how different parts of the elites are playing different time of the different aspect of this kind of uh, uh, narratives and of course the fact that now uh, a large part of the Azov battalion in Mariupol has been kind of surrendering will probably be used by Russia to kind of organize a showcase trial of the so-called uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Nazi battalion. So that would be interesting to see how they are kind of navigating uh, uh, that kind of the, the, the radicalism of the denazification uh, uh, narrative. They were downplaying it 
uh, a few weeks ago compared to early uh, the first week of the war. I think now that they have uh, several hundred of uh, as of battalion members, they may really decide to play that. But I think on our side, and I will stop here, the, the question is really also what is the West end game and how do we think we have to begin talking about how do we sit at the table of negotiation? How do we want to talk to Russia? What will be the time where when the war will stop, how we will be able to rebuild uh, uh, something and the kind of inflation of narrative we have seen since the beginning of the war about Russia is fascist is I think a really dangerous trend because it doesn't allow for policy imagination to reinvent what will be the future of Europe, right? If we say that Putin is Hitler, then it just means we don't want to sit at the diplomatic table because you don't negotiate with Hitler. Right? And I think that's a really, that's a big strategic mistake because it's kind of uh, uh, um, hampering us imagining the time where we will have to reinvent a solution that will be much broader than just the war in Ukraine, but that will be to decide what is the future of how Europe, especially, will have to share the same continent with Russia. And I think dreaming about a kind of total collapse of the Russian regimes is, is a big strategic mistake because this regime, even if it has been shaken, and I will stop on that element, is resilient. And all the criticism we have on, you know, the Russian economy being more and more autarkic, deglobalized, archaic, that's also a sign of resilience, right? The Russian economy can function in a very low level and dysfunctional level for pretty long. And so I think we have to realize this, this capacity of Russia to be resilient and to understand that it will be time for us to also begin discussing what do we want to want to get at the end of the war. And I will stop here. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, Anatole, you're up. Thank you, James. And thank you so much, Marlene. Uh, I, I actually have very, very little to add to what Marlene said. I think she, she covered everything um, uh, excellently. Um, clearly, the, this war has been a disaster for Russian culture. Uh, that raises two questions. Uh, the, the first is, how much of a disaster will it turn into? Um, and secondly, will it be relatively temporary, or at least will the worst effects go away, or will it be permanent? Uh, now, the, the first question, I think, relates to something that Marlene raised, which is the point that so far, uh, the Russian government has not launched mass mobilization. Of course, many observers uh, expected them to do that. Uh, um, on the occasion of Victory Day, uh, if they get and of course the reason they didn't was that, as Marlene also said, um, while there is support for this war in the population, there is very little active enthusiasm in the population at large. Now the thing there though is that, um, uh, as a number of military analysts have pointed out, if the war goes on and on and Ukraine basically raises, you know, goes in for First World War style conscription and mobilization. Uh, then, um, it's difficult to say how quickly, but within a year or so, uh, Ukraine will have raised enough men seriously to outnumber the Russian army in Ukraine. And of course, uh, NATO and the United States will arm them and fund them. Uh, now, at that point, um, uh, you know, un unless uh, we have reached some kind of compromise peace by then, uh, well, obviously, I mean, the hope would be in Ukraine and, and the West that Russia would then, in effect, surrender. Uh, but if, indeed, the, the Russian government, you know, has to launch mass mobilization, then one can imagine um, a vastly intensified program uh, of trying to whip up nationalism, perhaps something, you know, closer, in fact, to, to totalitarianism. So that is the, um, that, that is the first point. Um, temporary or permanent? Well, this depends, of course, on how long the war lasts. It, it should be said that, of course, much of what's going on in, in, in Russia, uh, as well as, well, very understandably in Ukraine, but also somewhat, um, 
uh, what would be a, a suitable euphemism, vicariously perhaps, uh, in the West. Um, but this this kind of cultural hysteria is very much, of course, what one expects to see in in wars um, on on both sides. And so, that, yes, I mean, the question is whether whether this becomes a permanent feature of Russian culture again, as it was to a considerable extent under the Soviet Union, though, of course, with varying levels of intensity, uh, or whether when or if the war comes to an end, this diminishes again. Now here, um, uh, as Marlene has said, the West is also feeding into this uh, by um, the uh, boycotts and uh, really quite, you know, shameful um, actions and language against Russian culture in general, all of which are, of course, immediately taken up and repeated by the Russian state media, you know, to, to, to c convince the, the Russian people of, um, you know, uh, implacable and, and hysterical and irrational anti-Russian feeling in the West. Um, uh, and uh, so, of course, the uh, responsibility for um, whether Russia, Russian culture will be, if not permanently alienated from the West, after all, the Soviet Union was not permanent uh, for a very considerable period, uh, that also lies in our hands. And th there, of course, as Marlene has said, Russia is, is now deeply isolated from the West, uh, but um, there is the rest of the world. Um, there is China. Uh, and uh, of course, from that point of view, uh, th this raises the question of um, whether, sorry, I, I, I mentioned the word Eurasianism with great deference in the, in the presence of Marlene, who is the greatest expert in the world on this. Um, much of Eurasianism ha has been a, a fairly thin state program. Other parts, no, have had a really, uh, of course, deep cultural element. Um, I mean, is this war going to produce a long term phenomenon whereby there really is a, uh, a, 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 a deep and wide and uh, you know, deeply intellectually thought out and supported turn uh, of Russian culture in this direction and what it will consist of? Uh, so that's a question for the future. Um, then there is the question of the character of, of Russian nationalism. And here, um, you know, Mar as Marlene said, you know, uh, by g comparing Putin to Hitler and so forth and so on, it's not just that this rules out any possibility of, ne of diplomatic negotiations and a solution. But of course, it totally misses the point um, that, uh, as I have heard so often from Russians and Ukrainians and basically anyone who lived in the former Soviet Union, things can always get worse. Um, if you look at the character of Putin's nationalism, uh, something that, you know, once again, t totally against cretinous and ignorant Western prejudices, you know, stares out at you is that Putin is not, in fact, an ethnic nationalist. He's a state nationalist with deep roots in the state nationalism of the Soviet Union and indeed of the Russian Empire. And the Putin elites are, in Russian terms, extremely multi ethnic, including, by the way, people of ethnic Ukrainian origin. Um, and, uh, you, you know, as, as has not nearly widely enough been pointed out, um, of course, Putin has never, despite obvious temptations to do so, uh, attempted to, to use the anti-Semitic card in Russian politics. Um, hence one reason why, you know, his personal relations with, uh, with Israeli governments have been very good. So, uh, cl cl on the one hand, um, you know, one, one can see an impetus <laughs> Uh, from this towards Eurasianism in Russian culture and the character of Russian nationalism. But it is also, of course, entirely possible uh, that one will see, you know, a much, much stronger tendencies uh, towards ethnic Russian nationalism, uh, which as Putin himself has written uh, in a, an essay for Nezavisima Gazeta um, in 2011, which deserves to be better known, uh, would be a catastrophe for the Russian Federation, which is by nature um, a multi-ethnic and multicultural state, now, of course, with, as he wrote, Russian culture as the sort of the central element. Um, so so uh, here, you know, here is a, a, a great danger. And this is something that I've said ever since 
actually, I wrote my book on uh, the, the Baltic revolutions uh, now, um, almost 30 years ago. The people who ask for Russia uh, to become a, quote, normal, unquote, nation state uh, should be careful of what they're wishing for. Um, Russia as a quasi empire has been much, much more comfortable uh, for ethnic minorities within Russia, uh, and also, of course, for the desire to get on with certain other republics rather than to exploit their own internal ethnic differences, notably Kazakhstan. Um, an awful lot of normal uh, nation states around the world, including in Europe, are also deeply, deeply ethnic nationalist in a way which could turn Russia into a, you know, an even uglier, um, and certainly for much of its population, more dangerous uh, phenomenon uh, than uh, exists today. Um, finally, on um, on the, the the future of the regime, once again, I, I you know I agree with Marlene. One, one um, I think sees definite elements of consolidation. Uh, one sees how Putin's use of the, uh, uh, the the idea, and of course an increasingly accurate one, that this is a proxy war, certainly of the United States, or if not of NATO as a whole. Uh, against Russia is being used to cover up um, the uh, absolutely, you know, what ought to be glaring uh, both crimes and blunders of the uh, of the regime in the invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, how long will that work for the, the, the regime? Well, you know, once again, we have to um, resilience, certainly. Uh, but uh, we have to see if for example, down the line, um, deeper economic suffering is combined with, um, you know, attempts at much greater mass mobilization for war. Um, one can also imagine, of course, uh, possibly in the guise of Mr. Navalny, um, a protest movement which was both bitterly anti-Putin and extremely nationalist. Mm -hmm. So there are many, you know, many, many open questions um, for the future. Uh, but certainly, uh, I would say that, um, I mean, clearly, this war has been a disaster, obviously, for Ukraine, obviously, for, but also for Russia itself. Um, and the longer the war goes on, and the more it does become a struggle, in effect, between Russia and the West, uh, the more disastrous those consequences are likely to become. Thank you. Thank you, Anatole. Um, we are going to go now to Yerevan to Petro Shakaryan. Uh, it seems a way to follow some of Anatole's important comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Katrina. And, you know, uh, it's good, to, it's wonderful to be in such good company. Uh, Marlene, Anatole, thank you for your uh, excellent remarks. I actually want to talk about this issue of um, what is the impact of, uh, when we look at this war in Ukraine, of course, uh, we had several events leading up to it. You know, the most prominent of which has been discussed about has been the NATO expansion issue, also these post-Soviet revolutions, color revolutions. And, you know, I mean, especially speaking as somebody who is of Armenian origin, who is, you know, kind of reporting to you from Yerevan, I mean, I, I you know, follow these issues uh, quite uh, closely. Um, so basically, I mean, I, the question should be, has, um, you know, basically, first and foremost, um, people in the post-Soviet space, as the other panelists well know, and as most of our, uh, you know, listeners know, are more than capable of democracy. This idea that we can bring democracy to the post-Soviet space, or these policies of NATO expansion, I would submit, have had a catastrophic impact on the developments of democracy, if we understand democracy as a mix of freedom, equality, potential for economic opportunity, so on and so forth, it's been a disaster for democracy and civil society in post-Soviet countries. First and foremost, Russia. And we can see that through uh, not only the reactions that have come about as a result of this war, right? You'll hear more of an uptick of rhetoric of, uh, about traitors, national traitors, you have uh, representatives of the liberal faction of the Russian ruling elite, Mr. Medvedev, who has now uh, become very critical of Europe. That should tell you something. That should tell the West something, that now you have the uh, leader of the so-called liberal faction of the Russian elite 
criticizing Europe. So, so right there, there's an issue. But you have this now, this increased rhetoric of you know traitors in our midst. Um, you know that we need to kind of uh, you know get them out, uh, or that we should uh, not uh, that they that they uh, that they should just if they love the West so much that they should go to the West and so on and so forth. Um, that this kind of rhetoric is contributing to a process that we've been seeing over the years. When we see, for example, kind of the uh, recent uh, closing of Memorial, we see the foreign agent law, the anti-NGO law. These are this. These are not. This is not evidence of democratic success. And Ukraine, frankly, too, has also been um, a country that has de-democratized. We have Mr. Zelensky, who is lionized in the West as a great democratic hero, but he has banned opposition parties in Ukraine. So if we look at this uh, war, but also if we look at the events leading up to it, the effort to promote democracy, the effort to expand NATO has been a disaster for the natural process of democratization in the post-Soviet space, which I would submit again, the people here are more than capable of doing it themselves. We saw that with Khrushchev and de-Stalinization. We saw that with Gorbachev and Perestroika and Glasnost. People, you know, the American government didn't tell Gorbachev to make those reforms. They didn't tell Khrushchev to de-Stalinize the country. This is a, an endogenous process. And the uh, geopolitical dynamics externally have disrupted those processes and have actually created more room for repression, more room for um, the potential of even worse repression that we're seeing now. So Marlene mentioned that, yes, we have repression, but it's at a very light level from what it could be. And, you know, I, I've worked in the archives in Yerevan and in Moscow, and I've worked with scholars at Memorial. I can tell you about the Stalinist repressions. Those are real repressions, right? And we haven't seen anything, I mean, to that level, but it could get that bad. And that's, that's where these policies, these foreign policies are leading us. And I think that that's something that we should definitely, uh, you know, uh, take into consideration when we, when we think about this, that it is not, if we think these policies are helping democracy, they're, they're spreading democracy, that they're democratizing the region, it is in fact doing the exact opposite. And people have been warning about this for many years, by the way, and including, uh, you know, uh, Katrina, your late husband, Steve Cohen, has, has been talking a lot about this, that this has not been helpful in, in any sort of way. So we have that. And also the other question is, would the, you know, some advocates of, uh, you know, democracy promotion in, in the United States, can we even say that this has been beneficial for the United States? I don't think so. I mean, look, we've actually been witnessing an erosion of democracy in the United States. We've been witnessing the rise of kind of corporate power in the United States, the rise of the war party in the United States. Uh, you know, we see the influence of the arms industry, certainly on this conflict in Ukraine, but not only the wars in Libya, Iraq, Syria, all across, uh, you know, the Middle East and even the greater Middle East. We talk about Afghanistan. So. I, I think that, frankly, uh, you know, however you slice it, actually, it's been a disaster for democracy in, in the Western world as well, too. So that's when we talk about, uh, you know, domestic repercussions, it's important to look at uh, not only the impact uh, in terms of, uh, you know, on Russia and Ukraine and post-Soviet countries, but also the impact uh, in terms of uh, the Western world itself. So that's pretty much, you know, all I have. I just want to, you know, say that I concur fully with Anatole in terms of the idea that if we had a Russian ethnic nationalism, so it's one thing to have a state nationalism, but if you have a Russian ethnic nationalism, that will be a, a, immensely catastrophic, not only for the Russian Federation, it goes without saying, but for the whole post-Soviet space. And also I would say that those commentators in the West who hope that the war in Ukraine will result in Putin falling or you know, the regime crumbling or something like this, it could result in something, a, a level of violence that we haven't really seen since the Russian Civil War. 
across Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Russia, and all these republics. It could be immensely catastrophic and immensely you know, violent. So we don't want something like that. And that does not in any way benefit American national security. So on that note, I, I, yeah, I, I think that this, if we look at the war in Ukraine, we look at its domestic implications, it has not been good and it has certainly not helped uh, democratization in any way or the natural process of democratization. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Petro, for those uh, important remarks. I wanted to ask Marlene and uh, Anatole a, a question about the issue of um, the war parties. War parties rise at times of Cold War, at times of rising nationalism. Marlene, who, who would you put in the war party? You've written about many characters in the rise of illiberalism in the transnational illiberal movement. And how are they relating, by the way, to other countries? Um, and in that context, Anatole, I remember your piece of months ago about Macron, and perhaps we were witnessing his channeling of de Gaulle and there might be a more independent Europe. But at the moment, as I think both of you and Petro alluded to, the, uh, the de decoupling the deglobalization is essentially de-Europeanization because the global South is looking, it seems to me, on this war as having impact, food shortages, resource wars, other, but not directly involved. Uh, what are the impacts of the deglobalization, de-Europeanization, both politically, internationally, and economically? Because we've seen some movement toward the de-dollarization of the financial system, which seems significant if that continues. So uh, yeah, Mar and Marlene, if you might, I think um, Anatole referred to the possibility of a protest movement where it might arise. It certainly seems it would need to have a nationalist component, but do you see, there is Navalny of course, who's always talked about, because you know, Americans have the image but the other day I saw that Putin is now changing the role of governors. They will no longer be elected. I think many of them, the key ones will be appointed. Do you see in the, around the country a kind of mobilization that might lead to a protest movement? Well, I think to, to see a protest movement uh, developing, it would mean that we would need to have really like, so the sanction impacting really like largely everyday life, which it may be doing, but it will still, still take a few months to be visible. So far, it's mostly inflation, but not many other things visible for, for kind of average citizen. And we would also uh, need probably to have mobilization. I think mass mobilization could kind of trigger a, a, a protest. I don't think we, we should hope for any kind of liberal Navalny type to arrive. All those who first they were already a minority and then now the majority of them have left. So they are abroad. And usually once you are in opposition abroad, your capacity to influence what is happening in your home country is even lower than when you are at home. So if something happened in terms of regime change and protest, it will be by people who are already inside the system, who are already insiders, but consider that, okay, it's time to change things, otherwise the whole pyramid of power may be collapsing. And I think the nationalist element will indeed probably be a very strong one. I mean, you cannot hope to have suddenly a kind of pro-Western <laughs> uh, 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 mobilization arriving. So it will be from inside the system by people who are already pretty high or mid-level senior official, and it will have a nationalist um, uh, uh, component for sure. The party of war, as we can identify it, and of course it's very difficult and it's probably it's more individual expressing their own opinion that the kind of constituted uh, group, but we have some names of people from the security services or the, the, the security council like Patrushev. We had Dmitry Rogozin, who has always been a very vocal uh, uh, nationalist, they kind of very aggressive toward the West. We have those who are kind of doing more kind of de zealous demonstration of over loyalty, kind of Kadyrov style, but we Medvedev has been shifting clearly from the former so-called liberal to belonging to the party of war, which is interesting because I don't know what this tells if people really believe what they are saying, but it means that if they think they have to express themselves on the Russian media landscape to say things that are more radical than the official lines, it also means they think 
it's worse for their own career to do that, which means their own projection on how the regime will be evolving, that it will become more hardliner than it is already is. And then there are some more kind of technocratic people that are either in the presidential administration or inside the United Russia Party that seems also to be moving with very, very strong narrative. And the text that was published by the, the infamous text published by Ria Novosti uh, early March that was really genocidal toward Ukraine was published by a journalist who is a no one politically, which means that if he was publishing that in Ria Novosti, there was someone in, over him, a patron who wanted that kind of narrative to arrive in the discussion just a few days after after Bucha. So, so I think it's just telling us that there are tensions inside the, the inner circle about the level of radicality that they want to be kind of pushing forward. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> on, on the party of war and, and also on France and Europe, I mean, something that I heard for the first time in uh, 2019 and then heard much more strongly at the Valdai conference in October of last year uh, was that for years uh, large sections of the Russian establishment had been kicking themselves but also to a certain extent blaming Putin for not invading half of Ukraine in 2014 when of course they could have done so militarily very easily and by the way when of course they had an elected president uh who i mean they, they'd have had to beat him around the head to get him to do it but you know they could have installed yanukovych somewhere in the east and said look this is our, this is the elected president uh let's let's talk let's let's negotiate on the constitution and putin um was being blamed once again you know rather quietly privately and so forth but still uh, for having uh, invested too much hope, although this was, of course, by, by no means just Putin. I mean, this, this was very much a wider uh, hope of the Russian establishment. But um, it, it also, you know, br brings out um, that you, you know, P Putin has changed, but he's changed under the impact of events, if you like. Uh, but that Putin invested too much hope in France and Germany. And the idea that um, they would uh, broker an agreement uh, over uh, over Ukraine that would leave you know Russia with a considerable measure of influence within Ukraine, and of course uh, that hope was kept alive by the Minsk Agreement of uh, of twenty fifteen, but thereafter, of course, the French and Germans did absolutely nothing actually to to to. to push that agreement through to get the Ukrainians to implement it, to mobilize American support for it. And so this loss of faith in, 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 in Europe on the part of the Russians, the, the loss of faith in uh, European, you know, any, any possibility of European strategic autonomy and reconciliation with Russia, I think is a critical factor. Um, in bringing about the war. It didn't die completely until the very eve of the war, because from what I gather, Putin was hoping that, that Macron would advocate a treaty of neutrality or, 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 or would at least call for a moratorium or give something you know, that would not just uh, you know, allow Putin to claim diplomatic success over Ukraine, but, but also keep alive that idea of splitting Europe uh, and and America. Um, but already, you know, al already last year, you were beginning to have some, you know, e e people who previously had been, you, you know, by no means nationalist hardliners saying things like, you know, to the West, we have only enemies. Um, now, for the future, I mean, at the moment, European strategic autonomy looks dead as a nail. Uh, but of course, we have to see what what happens. I mean, to, talking to some of the French and the Germans, if we go into the autumn with deepening economic crisis um, in Europe as well as in the, the wider world, you know, facing a, a European winter of energy shortages and much higher energy prices, and if America were to be seen to be blocking possible paths towards ending the war or a peace settlement, uh, then if only under the lash of public discontent in Europe, uh, it is, I suppose, possible 
that the French and the Germans might, to some degree, uh, you know, develop a, an, an autonomous line. Uh, but so far, I mean, every hope of that has always been disappointed. Yeah. One thing I want to also add to what Anatole has said has been actually there was the uh, story that was leaked to the Wall Street Journal where actually Schultz had proposed to Zelensky the possibility of neutrality for Ukraine, which Zelensky unfortunately with, you know, rejected out of hand. And that was one of those, uh, you know, uh, events uh, leading us on this pathway to war, uh, unfortunately. So the Europeans actually, I was, I have to say, you could actually, even in the months leading up to this, you could have decoupled the Anglosphere of uh, you know the Americans and, and the and the British from the continental Europeans, at least the continental Western Europeans, um, on this issue of Ukraine and Russia and and trying to find a, a peace. It was very clear that that, that Paris and uh, Berlin wanted to uh, find uh, some sort of peace and avoid uh, at all costs a, a kind of catastrophic war in Europe. I mean, we also have to think this too. It's very easy for the uh, many Americans to talk about fighting or a war in, in Europe. Uh, as long as, first of all, they're not doing the fighting, and number two, um, they don't know, they don't consider the history of war in Europe. I mean, we look at we look at uh, you know the wars of religion. We look at the First World War, the Second World War. This for for Europe, especially when we look at the formation of the European Union, this was a statement against the war. The reconciliation of France and and Germany was a statement uh, against war. And so for Europeans um, to avoid a, a war on the scale of all costs was the ideal uh, scenario, but unfortunately, we, we see where this has uh, taken us. On the radicalization bit, also I think that um, we see uh, with the recent developments in the post-Soviet space, with Kazakhstan, for example, the CSTO acting basically as a Warsaw Pact, sweeping in and saving uh, the government from what could have potentially been another kind of color revolution, possibly with Turkey's uh, support. Um, this, uh, this, I think many hardliners, I'm sure in the Kremlin turned to Putin at that point and said, look, you should have done the same in Ukraine in 2014, kept, keep Yanukovych there. You should have swept in and, and, you know, kind of kept him in power to avoid something like this. And we would have had many, many more people living today in, uh, Ukraine and, and, you know, Eastern Ukraine in particular and Donbass, and we would have been able to avoid this. And look, uh, you know, that if you take a harder line, in fact, you'll be able to save more lives and there'll be more stability. And they would probably be making this kind of argument to uh, Putin. Petra, um, me, so I, that's, another, that's you, another thing to consider. Yeah. I ask you a quick question in terms of being in Yerevan. There's a narrative in this country, the United States, about the uh, brain drain, younger people yeah. leaving, and what that means for Russia's future. My sense is I've heard that Yerevan has become a hub for many Russians. Yeah, there are many, there are many, many, many and of them Tbilisi. here. And Tbilisi. And Tbilisi, and Tbilisi too. And actually the Georgians, uh, so Yerevan actually is, is ideal because you know there, there are many Georgians who of course uh, resent Russia for the Abkhazian South Ossetian issues, but not all Georgians, all right? There, maybe there's this idea that you know, Georgians are so nationalistic, but not all Georgians necessarily. But here in Yerevan, it's even a, a warmer, uh, reception and actually I have frequented many cafes where the Russians have descended uh, since their arrival and uh, many of them are people from the IT sector who thrive on international connections. In fact, Medvedev has talked about this, that we're losing uh, you know, brilliant young minds who we need for the IT sector to develop the IT sector in, in Russia. And you also have people who would be maybe anti-regime uh, you know, leaving uh, Russian Federation as well, and that has been extensively covered in the West, but also I would say that actually a m even more significant number of people who are afraid of the impact of their industry, which is the IT industry, what this war and the sanctions would mean for their industry, and also the impact of the sanctions on their everyday lives, because you have to think, I mean, these are, you know, young families, you know, who were part of this kind of up-and-coming uh, middle class in Russia. And so many of them have come here and they've embraced the culture. The Armenians have embraced them. So it's like kind of old home week. Everybody's speaking, uh, you know, Russian or actually some of them actually are trying to learn Armenian. It's kind of an interesting uh, element, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm actually glad you raised that because I had that. I was going to, to raise that issue as well, too. But yes, that is something you see. And um, 
yeah, it adds some spice uh, to the picture in Yerevan. Yeah, did you have a, I was going to ask one more question of uh, Anatole, if I could, and then we have, so today in Marla, today the Washington Post is uh, advertising for a new correspondent in Russia. <laughs> and I uh, think of you, Anatole, and, or ever, but you were a journalist. If, you know, if you took on that assignment, I'm just curious to, you know, what were the two or three, whether impact of, on Russia internally or the international, what would you uh, uh, take on as assignments? Uh, I think it fairly unlikely that I would be offered that. I think too, even, Anna. If I, <laughs> <laughs> even if I uh, even if I applied, uh, but I suppose I mean uh, the, the the first thing would be get out of Moscow, yeah. um, and you know tra travel. Though of course you know now that has become. Very more hard. difficult uh, but certainly i mean try to find out what what you know people in the russian provinces are thinking not just obviously about the war but also about the state about right, their yeah. society uh, their attitudes to the, to the elites um you know what they're still grateful to putin for what they are now angry about i mean that would be the uh, the, right. the first thing um and uh, the, uh obviously i mean in the context of the war um to judge uh, the yeah, I mean, the, the, the depth of nationalist commitment, um, as, as Marlene has said, I mean, at the moment, there is support, but it seems little enthusiasm. Um, of course, something that was so easy in the 90s, relatively speaking, um, contacts with the elites is now very difficult. And so many of the people who we know well, who used to be, you know, part of the, at least the outer circle of the Putin regime have been you know, pushed out. Right. I mean, that I think the reporting of the tremendous narrowing of the regime and of Putin's inner circle are entirely correct. And I think that also played a real part in, in the decision both to go to war and how to go to war. Uh, and um, so yes, then to, to, to and to, to bring out um, uh, both the, the, the changes driven by Putin since the beginning of the war, you know, the, the, the ha harsher authoritarianism, but also, as Marlene has said, uh, to try to reflect the fact that, I, you know, after all, uh, you know, this is still not uh, a fully totalitarian state and the nuances. And, and also, of course, to, to, to remind people, uh, you know, against, once again, the, the, so much of the Western narrative, uh, that Russia is still, thank God, a multi-ethnic yeah. state, you know, and that, um, I mean, it's interesting, seen, you know, seen from Tatarstan, for example, um, there is still, you know, of, of course, I mean, Tatar liberals uh, do not like the Putin regime, but they are, I think, much more than Russian liberals aware that yeah. you could see something much worse. worse. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can say, say that also from the same from, uh, you know, an Armenian uh, perspective as well, too. Um, the other thing also about the Russian nationalism is when we talk, and, and actually Anatole has, has raised this issue as well, and also uh, Marlene has raised this as well, too, this idea of that, well, you know, there is not maybe 100% enthusiasm for the war, but the more the Russians see this the strength of the Western reaction against Russia, the more we see things like cultural bans against Russian, uh, you know, against Russian culture, where, you know, let's say Tolstoy is, is canceled, yeah. or I don't know, uh, Shostakovich is canceled, um, that it will push people more and more and more to support the war, and you will have a greater kind of mobilization. I mean, the Russians, you don't want to, to, to push them, because if you push them, there there's going to be, uh, you know, a backlash. And, and uh, we're seeing that. I mean, if the Russians are, you know, of course, it's needless to say, a very proud people with a, with, a, with a great history and a great culture. And if you push them, you're going to get a reaction. So this is something else I think that many in the West fail to consider when they, you know, bring forth this idea of, quote unquote, canceling uh, Russian culture, and actually, especially to kind of use, uh, you know, the kind of social media power uh, efforts to kind of cancel Russia. 
And, and I, I don't think that that will lead to anything uh, good. James, yeah. the, the conversation was so good. We haven't asked many questions, but I turn to you as we close. Yeah, really, uh, really quickly, uh, Anatole, you just mentioned the nuances um, involved in looking at Russian politics. Um, Richard Stockler wrote in 2019, a book called um, Russia, Russia's Futures. And um, he, he writes, um, Putin remains in power uh, for so long because he addresses the concerns of major societal constituencies. Um, and he says in broad terms, uh, Russian society can be divided into four major factional blocks, each with its own view of how Russia should be organized. Um, and the four blocks um, that he mentions are the liberals, the Siloviki, the neo-traditionalists and the Eurasianists. And so I was curious um, as to the views of the panel, um, as to where you think the balance of power between the four blocks uh, that Sakwa writes about, you know, where are we today, you know, in the aftermath of, of, of February 24th? Marlene, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think the war kind of uh, uh, sh shrunk the, the differences, right? But uh, so I would say we have the, the ultra confrontational, so the party of war, we have, we still can identify the kind of the former liberal, those who thought that Russia can be a great power in tension with the West, but not in confrontation, the kind of, you know, Lukianov, uh, um, Kortunov uh, um, uh, uh, groups, the Eurasianist, they don't exist as such anymore in power. They are part of, they are integrated into the, the, the bigger group of just kind of the uh, 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 um, globally. So for me now that, I mean, the liberals are no more in the decision making, except in the, on the financial and economic sector, otherwise in foreign policy, they, they don't exist anymore. So you have more or less no, let's say you have three groups. You have the former liberals who didn't want the war, the, want, the ones who want a war, but in a limited uh, way where they hope Russia will be able to go back to business, more or less business as usual before, and the ones who got totally wild and think that it's the kind of the, the, the final major confrontation that can go, should go beyond the, the, the border even of Ukraine. But all the other the ideological differences, I think, are kind of have lost their tonality now because of the, the, the context. Uh, could I just say something too, really quick? I, I want to add in, there's also another group that we need to address, which is the Narodniki. So the people, the Narod of Russia and the centrality of the socioeconomic question. So this is a big problem that, that bedevils Russia and the whole post-Soviet space, this issue of socioeconomic inequality. It has not been fully resolved, even with Putin bringing some stability to the scene. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also something else that uh, there was recently some analysis of what could happen as a result of the war in Ukraine from this Ukrainian sociologist, Volodymyr Ischenko. And he basically was saying that the war could either result in uh, you know, a loss for Russia. And this could result maybe in the overthrow of Putin. It could result in the complete collapse of the post-Soviet space as, as a region. You could have civil war, you could have mass chaos, you know, a, a kind of a smuta, so to speak. Uh, but uh, there also could be a uh, possibility that you know, Russia would win the war and then they would almost have to buy off the population. They would have to justify to the Russian people and to Ukrainians why, why did this war happen, right? And to kind of help, uh, you know, the socioeconomic uh, conditions, because this is a big problem from uh, Moscow to Kiev to Yerevan to uh, Nur Sultan to all these different places in, in the post-Soviet space. The issue of the socioeconomic inequality, the social question, this is going to continue to bedevil Russia in the post-Soviet space uh, for, you know, the foreseeable future, unless there is a serious resolution to it. So this issue of Narodniki, this is a, this is a constituency that, in fact, actually, we mentioned different groups like Eurasianists, sex liberals, and so on and so forth. But in fact, it is the Narod who are the most important. When I was in Moscow uh, two years ago, uh, I would actually talk to people and say, what do you think about Putin? 
And they would tell me, they would openly criticize him on the basis that he had not done enough to, uh, you know, economy. create jobs. Yeah, for create, yeah, for the economy, it's, it's create it's jobs. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I wish we could keep this going. Um, I fear that this extraordinary conversation has to come to an end. We could talk for many more moons. And I'm very grateful to Anatole, to Marlene, to you, Petro. I'm reminded as you speak, Petro, of, you know, the truck drivers, which are bedeviling many countries' politics, I think originated in some ways in Russia. And yeah, Russia. Absolutely. absolutely. As did the miners and the solidarity between miners in Donbass and in Margaret Thatcher's Britain, which Fiona Hill brings up in her memoirs. Uh, yeah. In any case, you know, we need, I've received quite a few texts as we're talking about people haven't heard this. They don't know this, but they want to hear more of this informed kind of narrative shifting conversation. And we will take this and circulate it as broadly as we can. And we're very grateful for your time. And uh, coming to us from the UK, from Greece and from Armenia, this is a multi-national <laughs> call, but um, may we find um, the way forward. Um, and this was very helpful, very helpful. And I would ask those on the call to come to usrussiaaccord.org to see some of our archives. We've had uh, everyone on except Petro in previous conversations, and they've been as strong and important as this. So thank you very much and look forward to being in touch in these fraught, difficult times for and may the war come to an end in as Yes, absolutely. May all wars come to an end. <laughs> this is this is what we hope. So thank you very much, uh, Katrina. Spasiba. Merci, Shot. Good to see you. Thank Thanks you so much. And Anatole and James. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Adieu.